morning to you, Mr. Black, and thank morning, you for you. your time. Uh, well, the question is uh, quite obvious. It looks like we're getting to a new stage of our confrontation with the West. Now we're discussing tanks, armored vehicles, and according to Ursula von der Leyen, whatever weapon is required by Ukraine, it should be granted. So quite soon, uh, what should we be expecting? Nukes for the Ukraine? Are we facing a new stage of confrontation and only God knows what it ends with? It's, it's been escalating constantly. And uh, now you have the, the boys from Davos, uh, Switzerland, all of, these, all of these people who have no allegiance to countries, but they, they have an allegiance to the deep state. And... Uh, and you have the Ukrainians pleading with them for more war, more money. Uh, so I think there is this constant escalation. Uh, the, our leaders in the United States don't want to just suddenly say, oh, look, we're going to do all of this. We're going to go to war. But they keep inching closer and closer. So they are close to providing tanks. I hope they don't. But uh, I think there's a real risk they will. What's next? Well, definitely they're going to provide tanks. The Brits already mentioned at least 14 uh, tanks of their own. I'm not sure how good are they, but they're still tanks, so it's still a threat. And definitely they're twisting arms to Germany. So Germany, since the Second World War, will be Achtung Panzer and Nacht Ost. And for Russians, German tanks on our land, that's not just the red line. That's not just the red line. That's the beginning of the sacred war. Well, I know the German people do not want to provide tanks. Uh, the, the people are very much against it, but at the same time, uh, you have uh, Chancellor Schultz. He's under enormous pressure from the United States to uh, to provide tanks. He has the Leopard 2 tanks, which are fairly fairly good, fairly credible tanks. And they, they don't have very many of them because uh, before this war began, Germany had a total of 200 tanks in its arsenal. Just phenomenally... Uh, light arms. And the reason was that Germany perceived no threat whatsoever from Russia. Uh, but now we keep pressing them. Uh, it's hard to say where they'll come out, but I think uh, there, are, there certainly are elements trying to bring enough pressure on uh, Chancellor Schultz to force him to start providing tanks. But America must be happy. I'm, I'm not discussing American people, but the political deep state. They found stupid guys that are willing to die for the interest of the United States. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's basically fun. That's the best scenario. Ukraine became the avatar state. The, it's not the proxy war anymore. It's NATO war. But inside NATO weaponry, we see Ukrainian operators. And as soon as Russia realizes that we're fighting against NATO, that's completely a new stage of escalation. Well, so far, most of the people fighting are Ukrainians, but undoubtedly there are quite a number of Polish uh, volunteers who are there. They really are just members of the Polish army. Um, there certainly are people from NATO on the ground uh, as advisors, but the, the casualty rate of, within the Ukrainian army is phenomenal. Um, the, we've done some calculations and, and compared it to the casualty rate that the United States suffered during the Vietnam War. And from my calculations, of course, different populations, the United States and Ukraine, but uh, it looks like Ukraine is sustaining death, soldiers killed in battle, almost a hundred times the rate 
of Americans. This is on a per capita basis based on the sizes of the countries. Uh, but it's a, it's a phenomenal rate of death and it's, it's not sustainable. I don't think that uh, Ukraine will be able to continue doing it for much longer. Uh, but at the same time, we have Russia that has undergone a, a very ma major mobilization. We have several hundred thousand additional troops coming online. And um, Russia, from the very outset, it, it fought uh, outnumbered by the, by the Ukrainians. And, uh, and part of the problems they had is that Russia became overextended in a couple of areas like Kharkov. Uh, and it, uh, it had advanced too far across the, the Dnieper River uh, near Kherson. Uh, but now it has, it has moved back to very defensible, very strong defensive positions. And now it's beginning to advance. And I think we're seeing the results of, of a much more robust Russian army, a larger army that's able to sustain the offensive. And now we see that the Ukrainians are beginning to fall back. It looks like Bakhmut is, is uh, finally going to, uh, to fall over the next several weeks, perhaps. Uh, but I think we're going to see uh, Russia on the offensive before long. Uh, what's your estimate of uh, total casualties uh, of Ukrainian army? Well, there, there was something that was leaked not too long ago, and it, it got absolutely no press in the West. But there was a ex very extensive document that was uh, leaked from the Ukrainians, and it showed missing in action 35,000 men. Now, missing in action, typically most of those are, are people who were killed and uh, just not recovered. Uh, we know from obituaries and from uh, cemetery records uh, that there are at least 102,000. Now, this is, this is going back uh, perhaps uh, a month or six weeks ago. Uh, so the Ukrainian army has suffered a great deal more since then. The Probably the most accurate death toll that I can find, uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor estimates about 150,000 uh, Ukrainian soldiers killed in action. I think that's a credible figure, and it's far greater, far greater than Russian uh, losses, even though the Russian losses have been substantial, but they're nowhere near as great as the Ukrainian losses. Why so? Why there are so many Ukrainian kills and uh, much less Russians killed? Is it uh, the level of training? Is it the way Russians fight the war? Uh, so w what's the reason for this difference in casualty rate? I think to some extent the Ukrainians have felt compelled to win political points in order to keep the, the weapons flowing in. And uh, for this reason, uh, they, have, they have sent wave after wave of soldiers to attack. If you look at the, the battle uh, for Kharkiv and the region there, uh, the, the Russian forces were very, very thin. They were, many of them were sort of border guards and so forth. And it was a little bit of a chaotic retreat, but uh, the, the Russian high command told them, fall back, fall back. Don't just sit there and, and be slaughtered. So the, the Russian casualties were relatively small compared to the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians took enormous casualties from Russian artillery as they surged forward. Now, they took a lot of terrain, but it wasn't particularly important terrain. Now, if you look at the battle for, uh, for Kyrgyzstan, um, the, 
uh, General uh, General uh, Sirovokin, who, who was in charge at that time, conducted one of the most beautifully, precisely executed strategic withdrawals. Uh, the, the, the Russian army was very dangerously extended across the Dnieper River, and they withdrew. They withdrew without suffering any casualties. They withdrew without leaving behind any equipment. Uh, they left uh, and, and they withdrew civilians beforehand. It was one of the most beautifully executed uh, retrograde movements. It, it'll probably be studied by the U.S. War College uh, in future years. How, how did they do this? And now they are behind very extensive multiple lines of defense. So uh, at the same time as this was happening, of course, the, the Ukrainians were moving forward and the Russian artillery was chewing them up, killing lots and lots of them. And so they, the Ukrainians were gathering land that wasn't particularly important and they were sacrificing enormous numbers of troops. Meanwhile, the Russians were strategically moving back into very defensive positions, strong defensive positions, and rather than, than hold on to untenable areas and sacrifice manpower. So this is, this is a totally different strategy. The Russians are willing to give a little land in order to save manpower. The Ukrainians feel compelled to gain land in order to make political points with the West. So basically we can say that whatever they are claiming that Russian military is weak, that Russian generals are badly trained, that the Russian army and soldiers badly motivated is bullshit. So that's not even close to reality. So what's your forecast? Well, <clears throat> what is happening? Uh, there now are three very large reserve armies forming. Uh, there are perhaps 100,000 in uh, Belarus, uh, and they they're in a position to threaten the supply lines uh, coming in from, from Poland. Uh, there is another very large army in the south, uh, which is in a position perhaps to cross the Dnieper River and perhaps threaten Odessa. And then there is a, a third large reserve army, uh, which is in the east. And so uh, it, it puts the Russian high command in a posture where they can launch a very major attack and they can do it from several different directions. They could do it simultaneously or they could do it in one direction and draw all of the Ukrainian uh, reinforcements to defend against that Meanwhile, drawing down their forces other places, making them vulnerable to attacks from there. So part of it is just raw numbers. The, the Russian army has an enormous number of tanks, tremendous number of, of artillery pieces, and now they have tremendous advantage in manpower. And so I think, I think the Russian generals actually did a very, a very credible job. Uh, I think, uh, yes, the, the withdrawal from, from Kharkiv was chaotic. There was a lot of equipment lost in it, but not many men. And in Kyrgyzstan, it actually was just a, a magnificent, to, to me, I viewed it, looking at it very dispassionately, I looked at the withdrawal from Kyrgyzstan as a significant tactical victory for the, for the Russian forces. And so it, right now they're in a very powerful position. The Ukrainians uh, are becoming exhausted from their losses of manpower. 
Uh, they, they just announced that there was going to be an extension, the mobilization, and the person who made the announcement, the spokesperson, cautioned people not to panic. Well, Russians are not panicking about their mobilization, but what's happening is in, in Ukraine, families have lost so many people that there's simply nobody left. And so they have to caution people, don't panic, don't panic. Uh, but we're going to have to raise some more manpower. They've only got so much to raise. And I think at some point, the whole system is going to come unglued on them. Is there any way that West can change this positive for Russia scenario? What kind of weapon can be a game changer? Is there a weapon that can be a game changer? It's conceivable. Um, the, you know, the addition of, of a massive tank army, uh, the, you know, it would, it would require more than a, more than a handful of tanks. It wouldn't 50 or a hundred Western tanks that it would make a difference, but it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't change the outcome. Um, you know, it's hard to say. It, it just, it depends on, on how much strength there is left, how, how much willpower there is within the, these different countries, including the United States. Uh, people are getting very tired of, of this unlimited expenditure of money. Ukraine is, is now a, a total welfare state. Uh, the West is paying all of their civil servants. It's paying all of the salaries for their government employees, for their soldiers. Uh, they're, they're really a total welfare state at this point. So you can never say that one side or the other is definitely going to prevail. But I think the, the Russians, uh, the, the Russian economy has weathered the the various assaults on the economy, uh, it, it remains robust. Uh, the, the mobilization was very successful. And even though there was people said, well, you know, some Russians went across the border to escape the draft, 10 times as many left Ukraine to avoid their draft, 10 times as many. And, and some of the Russians are actually coming back now, the ones who just initially went over and now they're thinking, well, you know, uh, the country's behind the war, the people support it. I, I, got a, I got a letter from my uncle who said, come on, come back. You know, you, you have a duty to your country. And I think there is a, there's an increase in, in uh, motivation and patriotic fervor. And some of, the, some of the people who have fled the country are people you don't ever want back. You're, you're happy not to have them. <coughs> That's very true. We're very happy not, not, not to have them. And by the way, as you mentioned, some of them fled Russia. But a lot of Ukrainians found a new home in Russia. More than 3.5 million people from Ukraine <coughs> came to Mother Russia. And that's an incredible number. Uh, I'm not sure that it's well known in the West, but Russia is number one country that hosted Ukrainian refugees. Not Poland, not Germany, not UK, Russia. You know, I think what people overlook is that the areas that are being contested, the, the area to the, to the east of the Dnieper River, it's largely Russian. The people are, are ethnic, cultural, linguistic Russians. And uh, they broke away in, in the Donbass and in Crimea. They broke away only after the legitimate elected government of Kiev was overthrown by the CIA and by MI6 in 2014. And then immediately afterwards, uh, they, they passed this, this new revolutionary junta that took over in Kiev, passed these anti-Russian laws that were targeted 
at the Russian language and that uh, made it impossible to, to teach children in, in the language that they spoke at home. Uh, and it's no wonder that th these areas declared their independence. Uh, they had much more reason to declare their independence than the U.S. colonies did when, when we declared independence from Great Britain. Uh, Great Britain at least didn't come and say, well, you can't use your, your native <laughs> language anymore. You've got to start speaking a foreign language. That's a great point. That's a great point. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for your time and your great expertise.